Today is the 11th of January, 2012. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. And today we are in Whitehall, New York at the Isaac Griswold Library. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and date and place of birth, please? Uh, Charlie, Charles L. Bennett, uh, Troy, New York, 1952. And did you grow up in Troy and attend school there? No, I've been all through White Hall School. I started, we moved up here when I was four years old. Mm -hmm. My mother's from White Hall, my father's from Putnam. And what year did you graduate from high school? 1970, White Hall High. Once you graduated, did you go to work or did you go on to college? Well, or I, secondary I school? went to work and then I was about to get drafted so I joined the Navy. And why did you decide on the Navy? Because I wanted to stay out of Vietnam. Okay. And uh, where did you go for your basic training? Great Lakes, Illinois. And was that your first time away from home, basically? Basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. And what was basic training like for you? Well, naturally, it's a whole different world, a whole different environment. Uh, it wasn't too bad, it physically demanding, but you know, it really wasn't that bad. Just follow orders and you stay out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Once you completed your basic training, where did you go next? Uh, I went to uh, Great Lakes again, main side, what they call main side. I went from recruit training command over to main side for schooling. Now that that schooling, did you have a choice on that? Is yeah. Well, I was supposed to have been a machinery repairman when I went in, but they didn't mm -hmm. need any of them, so they made me a boilerman. Right. So I had to go there for basic propulsion engineering, and then I had to go to what they call BTA school. And, and what did you learn there? Uh, uh, how, how to uh, steam conventional uh, power plants. Mm -hmm. uh, steam boilers, 1,200 pounds, 600 pound systems, and how uh, different propulsion systems work. Mm -hmm. Did you learn welding and basic? Uh, no, that's what fitting. I was supposed to do. <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> you know the recruiters will tell you anything. <laughs> and how long did your schooling last? Uh, that was like three months. Mm-hmm. And once you completed your schooling, what happened next? Well, I got orders to uh, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, mm -hmm. to pick up the ship, the USS Joseph Strauss, DDG sixteen. And I went aboard ship in, I believe, August of 71. Now, how did you get to Hawaii? Um, well, I came home on leave, which I mm -hmm. had to pay for, but they paid my way from Chicago to Hawaii. But from Chicago to here, Great Lakes is just mm -hmm. the main town there is North Chicago. And from Chicago to uh, Honolulu, they paid for it. So you went on a commercial flight? Right. Well, no. I had to go on a commercial flight to San Francisco, and then San Francisco, you pick up the military flights, and right. they drop you off all across the Pacific or do, they, you know, wherever they're going to land, Cameron Bay, Da Nang, or wherever they're going at that time. All right. And you landed in Hawaii. Right. And how long were you, you there before you picked up the ship? Oh, just took a cab right to it. All right. Reported aboard. And was that... That was the first time you were aboard a ship in the Navy? Yes. And uh, did you work immediately in your specialty or did you go through a training program? Or no, no. They, they send you what they call mess cooking oh. for new guys on ships. So you go mess cooking and that is uh, while you're cleaning pots and pans and assisting the cooks. All the new guys go through that when you first go aboard ship. I was in until the next new guy comes aboard and replaces you. How how long? I was just looking just a few weeks. Oh, I see. Every day doing the same thing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then uh, then I got to go down in what they call the hole down mm -hmm. the fire room. I was stationed in the after fire room. There was two on this ship. Now what kind of ship was that? It's a Adams class guided missile destroyer. They were brand new at the time. They were converted gun destroyers from uh, the uh, Forrest Sherman. Mm -hmm. 4,500 tons, 437 feet long. And how many people aboard? Uh, roughly, there was 330 men and officers. What were your quarters like? Well, in a room the size of this one, you would bunk somewhere around 30 people. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> you know, they were the racks were three tall, uh -huh. 
and uh, you got to climb in. They were canvas, though. They weren't hammocks. <laughs> Fortunately, uh -huh. you have one little locker this big, uh -huh. about two foot square, and that was all of your whole life. Okay. Were you on, like, a specific shift? No, it, it rotates. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the uh, fire room gangs, the black gang snipes, as they're called, uh, were... Um, you know, three section duty, the rest of the ship was six section. So three section duty underway means you're five hours on, ten hours off, but then you work all day long. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you're lucky enough to have the watch during the day, then, you know, that's five hours you're on watch and you get to slack off. I mean, it, it was a lousy job. It's brutal hours. Mm -hmm. And we were so critically low on people, I've had to do a lot of other things out of my specialty. I had to carry ammo for a 50 caliber mount. Mm -hmm. I had to train with an M1 for deck watches. And when you're in close to shore, you have to throw grenades and you have M1 grenades for swimmers. Mm -hmm. uh, M16s at that time, you know, they're not going to go through a larger mm -hmm. tree. You needed a 30 out 6. So once you uh, got aboard ship, where did you go initially? I mean, did this... Well, initially, this we were... This was 1971. My ship was just coming out of the shipyard and they were doing what they call ref tray, a refresher training. Were you, were you considered a, a plank holder? Or? No, no. The ship was commissioned in 63. They I started see. building her in 61 in Camden, New Jersey. Okay. The Camden shipyards down there. Not to be confused with the Camden yards in Baltimore. This was New Jersey. All right. And uh, she was, uh, you know, relatively new as Navy ships go. Mm -hmm. and she was brand new for BDGs that had never been built before this class of ship, mm -hmm. 30 originals. And uh, it was uh, just a, a long process of uh, refresher training, how to steam these things, because they're very dangerous and very touchy to steam. We had lots of mishaps uh, over the years that I was on board. And uh, it was just hard, brutal work, hot, mm -hmm. sweaty. The, the heat in the fire rooms was almost unbearable, especially when you got over in the Duncan Gulf. Mm -hmm. It was extremely hot. You had to go from blower to blower, like there'd be a, a supply blower here. You'd have to run, say, to the other end of the room, get to the other one, and because you couldn't stand the heat in the middle. I mean, you, you pass out easily. Mm -hmm. uh, your your clothes would be wringing wet with sweat, but you had to wear them because they actually kept you cooler once they soaked in with sweat. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have really scuttle butts or what they call you know drinking fountain scuttle butts. Okay. down in the fire rooms. They, they wouldn't last. They would explode because of the heat. So we used to drink boiler feed water out of the VA tanks. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, I'm paying for that today. Uh-huh. How, how so? Well, I, I was... The water that we made, I was exposed to Agent Orange because of the water. Oh. It was in okay. the water. Although they were supposed to have stopped spraying that stuff in the middle of 71. I w watched it sprayed by Arvin Aircraft. Mm-hmm. And, you know, no, I didn't get there until January 72. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I think the VA admits they sprayed right up into 75. Mm -hmm. All right, so so you're aboard ship. Now, tell us about the, the first, uh, your first mission. Well, that was, the first mission we had was actually what we called chasing Russians. Mm -hmm. They had, uh, the Hawaiian Islands are considered... All, we, we claim all of the, the water around the islands and in between them. And even though it's like 200 miles of ocean between Honolulu and, and Hilo on the big island, you know, uh, we still claim all of that water. And so the Russians sent this fleet through there. So we had to go out in the middle of their pickets of my ship, and we were all a bunch of green recruits. My ship and another small the destroyer escort with only a three-inch gun on it, and an oiler, and uh, we just do pickets and in circles inside your pickets and harass the hell out of them until they left. Just follow them around. Yeah, follow them around and just you know just plain be a pain in their butt. Mm -hmm. and we were, and uh, that was our first mission. And then we come back and resumed refresher training. I, we didn't take off uh, for the Tonkin Gulf. I mean, uh, we're in and out of port, uh -huh. you know, doing drills, running exercises all the time going here, going there, wherever they send us. Now you said in and out of port. Did you get to spend any time off ship? Or? Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I did not like Hawaii at all. Mm -hmm. 
and I'd never spend money to go back there. Now, now, how much time did you spend around Hawaii? Oh, a year and a half. Okay. Uh, I was still homeboarded out of Hawaii my whole time in the Navy. Okay. Except for the last five months when they transferred the ship to Bremen and Washington for another overhaul. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so that would be, we left there in, I want to say September, might have been earlier, in 1974. We left away for I left away for the last mm -hmm. time. All right, you want to tell us about that Tonkin Golf mission, right? Uh, the first time, of all, everybody they're called Westpacs in the Navy, mm -hmm. and that's where mm -hmm. your your date at that time you were going to Vietnam for gunfire support. Uh, now, did you know you were heading there? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, we all knew we were going. Some guys went AWOL before we let took off. So, you know, lots of guys did. You know, I guess I was brought up different, so I went. And uh, <laughs> I should have went to wall probably is the nine site now. So I should have went to Canada. <laughs> I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we arrived in uh, the Tonkin Gulf the, for about the first month. It was uh, kind of routine. We were, you know, just shooting during the day, gunfire support, call missions. It really wasn't that hot at that time. You know, we were just, they, they would, Marines would call us, you know, shoot here, shoot there. How far off the coast were you? It uh, varied. Depends on where we were shooting and how far inland we were shooting. The guns range about 30 miles, but we could <coughs> shoot farther if we went up river. Mm -hmm. You know, which we did at Quang Tree City uh, for the battle for Quang Tree. But uh, in and around end of March um, is when we got a call. They sent us out what they call plane guarding. We were operating with the aircraft carriers, you know, just escorting in case any of the planes crashed, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they called us off plane guarding and sent us back to the Quabiat River. We had to relieve the, the USS Buchanan and another ship, I believe the Lloyd Thomas. We had to relieve them on the Quabiat River. We mm -hmm. went to Point Allison and we rotated between Point Allison and Point Betsy on the river. And what we were doing is uh, we were shooting at tanks and we were directing fire onto these tanks. They had just swarmed down. And they call, we didn't know what the hell it was. We call it Tet 72, but it, now I guess they call it the Easter Offensive. I didn't know that until recent years. And uh, they were just coming right down Highway 1, and they were trying to cross the bridges, well, the twin bridges, and one was a railroad bridge, the other was a road bridge on Highway 1. Mm -hmm. And that's the street. Uh, and they, we wouldn't let them cross the bridge, and finally they did blow the bridge, but it was, the guy that strung those was under heavy fire when he was stringing those. You know, we were shooting and destroying tanks and popping off uh, artillery pieces, surface air missiles, and you know, and it was heavy fire back and forth. No, you were up on deck. Uh, no, no, no. Nobody's allowed out on deck during this kind of exchange. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's suicide. And plus, you're in range. I mean, you're talking. The Quabia River is a large river. It's about the size of the Hudson. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you're in range of rifle. You're in range of rifles. I see anywhere on the river. You don't go out on main deck. I've done that. I've had to do that. And when you're up close, you throw the grenades over the side and that kind of thing. But I've had bullets with like whiz by my head and hit the bulkhead directly in the back of me. When that hot lead hits there, it splatters on the back of your neck. It burns like hell. It'll, it'll burn you. Mm -hmm. I've had it you know, splattered on my arms and all kinds of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From small arms, but uh, the big stuff really scared me more. I mean, uh, that's where, if you've ever seen those movies in uh, a ship shakes, you know, Yep. Well, that does happen, only it's a lot more violent. It's it's fast, and it's not a boom or a kaboom. It's a loud bang, and it's deafening. Uh, dust flies everywhere. It picks you right up, and it'll slam you against the wall, and that's how I got hurt. Mm -hmm. It picked my feet up in the air, and then just slammed me right up to the deck. My shoulder stopped. The rest of my body kept going because it was on a step on a walkway. <laughs> and then screwed up my back. Now, did your ship sustain any serious damage? Yeah, we, we were there with that particular night. We were two hours trying to get underway. We went dead in the water. Mm. And uh, we couldn't do anything. The ships were coming in. <laughs> there was, we, this was on Operation Linebacker. We were going inside North Vietnamese Harbor, blowing them up, <laughs> coming back out. Mm -hmm. Now, the aircraft, the air boys, the fly boys were going in, and then we would go in right behind them. They came out, and we were still coming back out. Uh, so uh, they're shooting at us and shooting at us, and we got over into our own minefields out of position. We went, we hit those mines and went dead. 
you know, knocked our boilers right offline. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't fire our guns. Um, the USS Berkeley DDG-15 had done the same thing, but she was in better shape than we were. So that was fortunate. I bring that up because they were sending MiGs out to finish us off. Jeez. So I'd be at the bottom of the Tonkin Gulf, except for the fact that the Berkeley was able to lock in on them with her missile radar. They knew they were targeted, mm -hmm. waved off. And that's the only thing that saved my life. I'd be dead right now. Mm -hmm. I'd be an MIA at the bottom of the, bottom of the ocean. Now, uh, <clears throat> how did you get the ship underway? Oh, that just lights up. We have to, we have turb diesel generators, but they're not big enough to do anything with. Mm -hmm. And they, they did start the diesel generators, got them off, and then we were able to have electric fuel pumps and electric four-strap blowers to start the boilers back up. As soon as we got the boilers back online, then we were able to go. But it takes a couple hours to do that. It doesn't mm -hmm. happen in five minutes. And in the meantime, there's repairs. We had to check for damage inside the boilers. We had to do a lot of things. Hotter than hell and uh, no ventilation mm -hmm. and it was just uh it was a fortunate night for all of us mm -hmm. how, how many guys were down in the boiler room trying to trying to get the boilers back well up? There's a, we only had a total of, at that time 12 men per fire room mm -hmm. and about the same in the engine rooms now on those same ships <clears throat> those ships are all gone but uh, even in the early 1990s they doubled the size of the crews on those ships mm -hmm. But back then there was ships that couldn't get underway because there was no crews. They had stopped the draft in, what, 71. The Navy wasn't getting any people in. And so, you know, we had all these ships and no crews for them. Mm -hmm. So we were skeleton crews on almost all of them, they, especially in the Pacific. The Atlantic, not so bad. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have a chief that was over you? Yes, chief. Ed Kowalski, he just died last year. Yeah. Uh, him and I, were, we stayed in touch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've, I've been in touch with a lot of the guys that I was with. There's a reunion coming up in Boston this year. Now let me ask you this, uh, a lot of the guys you were with, have they been suffering from the, the same? Out of a 12-man fire room crew, five are already dead. There's only one guy healthy. And uh, all of us have had to fight the VA for our benefits, mm -hmm. every damn one of us. And it took me almost 10 years to start getting paid. And, it, and it's all Agent Orange related? Not all of it. Uh, I was getting a small pension on my back, and uh, I also have asbestosis. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I have asbestosis. It's inactive. They're, they're calling it what they call it is pleural thickening, where the diaphragm starts thickening up. That's what asbestosis is, and it chokes you off. But uh, right now it's inactive. The Navy is aware of it because I made them aware of it, and mm -hmm. so they will pay me if it ever does. Mm -hmm. get active and if it gets active I'll be dead in two years Jeez. but they don't pay me any money for that one okay. fortunately that's a good thing after that uh, incident at the Tonkin Gulf where did you guys go next just got underway went right back at it okay you know artillery duels were commonplace yep. that was everyday practice I mean we've had big guns hit near us, right between the stacks, <laughs> right mm -hmm. overhead. Oh yeah, it was, it was constant. It was war. It was every day. And, and how much time did you spend there in that area? In Dong Hoi itself, where yeah. this happened, uh, we were only there a few hours. Mm -hmm. We were chasing, it, it was the, I think it was the 327th or the 527th NBA. Mm -hmm. And that was the unit that had swarmed down below the DMZ. And when they were heading back north, we were kind of chasing them all the way up. Then they bivouacked on the Dosan Peninsula. That's up near High Fong. That's inside what we call the Gold Circle. Mm -hmm. right? And so then they brought the whole fleet up onto the Dosan Peninsula. We caught these guys. They didn't even bivouac. They were so comfortable in being there. because mm -hmm. nobody hit, They didn't even hit it in 68. And they got hit once prior to this engagement. And then when we floated, we floated in about... 10 o'clock at night, we just opened up, and 7 in the morning, I was standing out on the main deck smoking a cigarette, nothing was coming back at us. Now, I take it at that time, there weren't any firing restrictions where you could fire, where you couldn't fire? Oh, of course there was. There was. But that was what we called the gold circle, which was also, you know, it's also a brand of condom. We used to call it going up screwing to the gold circle. I see. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, before this, 
nobody was allowed to shoot in there. That was for their bread basket and all this, and that's where they'd hide all their Sam launchers and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. and they, we weren't supposed to shoot inside that area, mm -hmm. in around Haiphong. And uh, after that, all bets were off. And then there's the incident with the USS Chicago, and that's where this guy was shooting. The captain of that ship ordered his. That was our newest and greatest um, guided missile cruiser. And she was shooting planes down inside China that were taking off. The captain got relief for that. Should have given him a medal. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that, that, was the, that was the war. You know, Jane was doing her thing. At, and I know guys that are dead from guns she said didn't exist. Yeah, I was going to ask you about her. Um, I can't think of you, anything evil enough to be done to her. Were you guys getting any any of this news? Yeah, yeah, we were. It was coming through through the Stars and Stripes is the only okay. versions we got. Yep. And that was the only, basically the only news we got. Um, my mother had asked the Whitehall Times, and you know, I had paid for a subscription to the Whitehall Times to send me, but it never got to me. Mm -hmm. It was always stolen before I ever got it because they would wrap it up and they would anything to read, you know. I mean, there isn't much. Sure. So, so it's, I never saw them. I never saw any of them. So I don't know what was happening back here. I only know what was happening over there. Mm -hmm. She's calling him comrade. You know, we back then we felt so isolated. We felt like the entire world was against us. Mm -hmm. and coming home on leave, you know, just right out here. People have known me my whole life, calling me a baby killer and a rapist. And you actually truth. had that happen here and right here in, in Whitehall. Oh, yeah, right out here. It's a place called Flubber Busters now. It used to be called Spardellas or Fireside Lounge. And girls that have known me my whole life did this, or most of my life. Mm -hmm. You were just home on leave. Home on leave from my first door. Okay. And I knew I was going back over. All right. How long were you back here after your first tour? For? Uh, I was only home on leave for uh, roughly three weeks mm -hmm. of just Lunar Christmas holidays, then I had to go back. And you went back to the same ship? Yes. I was at my old. Four years in the Navy, I was on the same ship. Okay, and where did you uh, catch the ship at? Yeah, back, back to Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, all right. Yeah, that was home port, and so okay. usually that's where you would catch it. But I mean, you could catch the ship anywhere if it was deployed and you were mm -hmm. assigned that ship. We would pick up guys in Hong Kong or Thailand or the Philippines, especially the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Did you did you spend any time at all, like uh, places like Hong Kong, Singapore? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Hong Kong was a liberty port. We couldn't do any work on the ship there because of the, of the treaty with the British and the Chinese. It was a British colony at that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we weren't allowed to work on our ships there. The only time we did was when we would have divers come out. Chinese divers had to be Chinese, couldn't oh. be our own. We had to hire their people to come out and clear the suction, or the mud suction from our uh, suction for cooling water. Uh -huh. They would always plug up when we would go up the rivers. And over in Vietnam and, and in going into China or going into Hong Kong because that's up a river. Mm -hmm. Anytime you get in a river, it's always you just suck up mud. I mean, these these suctions are this big around with huge pumps to mm -hmm. pull that water in. Okay. And uh, when did you go back to uh, North Vietnam? Uh, that would be Operation Linebacker 2. And I don't know the months. I think it's May. I believe it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It's fine. It's, uh, I believe it's May 1973. I got there. Now, was that when uh, you hit the mine and you were you were injured? No, that was 1972, June 4th, about 1:30 in the morning. Okay. Do you want to tell us about how that happened? Well. We were going inside the place called Dong Hoi, which I didn't know that until after it happened. They never told us where we were. Mm -hmm. Now this was in North Vietnam. This is in North Vietnam. Yeah, Dong Hoi was a major staging area mm -hmm. for North Vietnamese troops before they head south. And um, you know, we were hitting a power plant or something and plus chasing these troops. So we always had several targets. There's like 11 ships. This isn't just my ship. There's, there's a whole squadron of ships and usually there was two or three squadrons tied up under one Commodore. Mm -hmm. We were the flagship for the 33rd Squadron. We pull into this 
for you've got some ships sitting back here they're they're just covering you they're doing what they call gunfire suppression the army calls it an overwatch and uh, they're firing at people that are firing at you you're going in after specific targets mm -hmm. and that's what you were doing and then the flyboys are also in there the navy or the air force or whoever's hitting them at the time and uh, you just go in there and you just blow up everything and you leave that's the way we described it mm -hmm. coming back out is when we started getting everything close aboard so they're starting to you know zigzag right trying to stay out of gun don't let them bracket you mm -hmm. so we were going out and somehow we drove right over these mines the official version like I said is 100 and they call it the stars and stripes call it 132 millimeter shells however during my VA claims I believe the Navy admits that we ran over our mines this happened to one other ship and uh, they she made it into Subic Bay under her own power where they scrapped it now how seriously were you injured I was injured well enough where I just had a couple of days of, uh, you know, you know, just these goofy little pills and a couple of days in the rack and, you know, I was back up and around. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I never was, had to be transported over to the carriers or the hospital ships or anything like that. Were there any other sailors injured in that explosion? We had a few, but all minor injuries. No, okay. never had a fatality on my ship. Uh, now there are 16 other warships that were shot up that year and there were lots of fatalities on those mm -hmm. now how bad was your ship damage from those mines uh we had to pull into uh subic bay and it's mostly shock damage you know like uh, flanges coming loose uh you know things like that electronics that didn't work you know mm -hmm. it was all solid state back then and the fuses and all that stuff would get break get broken and, you know uh, just the electrical systems Lots of, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. but nothing major that, you know, we pulled in. Uh, they had to check the screws, too, because they put us in dry dock. And they had to check the propellers. And one of them was out of balance or something, and they fixed that, and we were underway. How much time did you spend there? In Subic. That time? Well, we were in and out of Subic all the time. Okay. Um, that's where we would go for repairs. I mean, these ships, they, they, you don't have to hit them directly. A near miss shakes them apart. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were always pulling in and out of Subic Bay. Um, at that time, probably just a couple of days, and I we were see. back over to gun. Everything was hot, and they couldn't, you couldn't spend any time there, like on Liberty. Uh -huh. And you had to get back over there. And uh, nothing was flying, it was the monsoons. So nothing was flying south. They seemed to be flying just fine north. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they couldn't get air cover in the south, but they couldn't. That was just us, that's why we were on the river. No air cover. So things get a little hazy to me. So if I contradict myself, call me on it, because they, then I have to stop and think, all right? Um, you don't think you forget this stuff, but when I talk to it, like some of the other guys, they remember things entirely different than the way I remember them. Mm -hmm. So I can see why the VA calls, you know, guys <laughs> like us unreliable. I don't know <laughs> if it's the fog of war or if we're just old and senile. I don't uh -huh. know. And then you went right back over again. Yeah. Yeah, after... Well, we were there, it was supposed to be what they call a six-month cruise, and, you know, we were gone like eight months. Second year, we were, uh, the second time we were gone, oh, probably eight and a half, nine months. We got home. Well, after we left, they sent us to, in 73, they sent us to the Indian Ocean. We were holding together with bubble gum and bailing wire, but they <laughs> sent us to the Indian Ocean for another Arab-Israeli war, and we got halfway there, and then they said, no, we'll send you back, and they relieved us with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so we went to Singapore, I crossed the equator, and went on back to Pearl Harbor. And we stayed in Pearl Harbor until, oh, like I said, I think it was August or September of 74, then went to Providence, Washington. Now, uh, crossing the equator, did you go through the uh, initiation? I sure did, <laughs> sure did. Yeah, I had my shell back. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that was uh, probably one of the more fun things that happened to my Navy experience, but I hated the Navy, you know. mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I only joined the Navy to stay out of Vietnam, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. Now, you said you ended up in uh, Proverton, Washington? Yes, that how, beautiful place. How long were you there for? Oh, like I said, six months maybe, because I got out in the end of January, 75. Mm -hmm. 
Now, did you consider staying in the Navy at all, or? I I did in the beginning, and then you know I just got you know so bad in the job that I was doing. I hated it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's nothing to like about doing that job. Yeah. They don't even have that job anymore. I mean, at least on nuclear subs, which are steam powered and nuclear carriers, you know, these things are all automated, and you know, you have plenty of crew to maintain them. Yeah. And those conventional steam power plants, well, you're not going to blow up, you know, half a city if it gets away from you, so uh, we're not going to give you anybody to steam them. And they, were, they were always in bad need of repair, constant uh, working on them, just constant. And the hours were grueling. I went days without sleep, especially in uh, days without seeing the sun, days without sleep. And then you're handling ammo, you're refueling, mm -hmm. you're taking on water because your evaporators can't keep up. How, how was uh, the food on, on board ship, especially when you were over in the area oh, oh, of North Vietnam? Over in Vietnam, it was terrible. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, like, uh, we got slop, but there was always plenty of slop. <laughs> but I mean, uh, like, you'd hold up a, a piece of lettuce and it would bend over like a cooked spaghetti. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, mold in the tomatoes. Cold, cold storage eggs, they look, smell, and taste rotten. Yeah. And so you find like steak sauce, mustard, you're always out of ketchup, so steak sauce, mustard, anything you can find to put on the disguise the taste. Yeah. The toast is always good though. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the cooks made their own bread and then that was usually pretty good. And you you know, if you had a cook that was a friend of yours, you get him a get a loaf of bread when he comes right out of the oven. Mm -hmm. Bring it down in a fire room, the guys would devour it. Did you ever uh, have any forms of entertainment like movies? No USO shows or anything like that? I went to a USO show in Hawaii. I saw one Bob Hope show there. Oh, okay. And that was when he was first getting his tour started, and I was still a, a young fellow before I'd done my first tour. But yeah, I saw Bob Hope in Hawaii. Could have saw him again, I think, he was in the Philippines. And, but I, I didn't go. Mm. That was over on Clark Air Base, and that was too much of a commute in the Philippines. Yeah. There you get shot, stabbed, robbed, to just disappear. So you had to be careful where you went. Yeah, it was like that anywhere in the Western Pacific. Now, when did you say you got out? Seventy, January of 75, in January 28th or 9th, mm -hmm. 1975. Now, you mentioned uh, going into the reserves or the National Guard, too? Yep. How did that uh, come about? Well, the economy wasn't doing very well and I needed extra money. So, mm -hmm. at first I joined the Navy Reserve, but it was, I joined the CBs. I wouldn't go in the fleet. I would have been promoted if I had gone in the fleet reserve, but I wouldn't do it. I, now, now, what rank were you when you got out of the Navy? I was an E-4. I would have been an E-5, but I didn't have a ton of time left in on active duty to get my stripe. So when I went to reserves, I got my stripe right off the bat. Okay. And uh, and then uh, I stayed there two years in the uh, CBs, in the 12th Battalion CBs. Where were they located? Right here in Glens Falls. And, um, you know, I, I didn't like the CBs because they were totally untrained. And if they ever activated that unit, they wouldn't last in combat in more than 30 seconds. I mean, they had team leaders, never controlled a fire team. You know, grenadiers never fired an M203. <laughs> machine gunners never fired a machine gun. Hmm. And they, you, when you would ask them about that kind of thing, they would say, well, just take out a copy of the CB Combat Handbook, tell you anything you need to know. Okay. <laughs> now, I joined the reserves in the CBs because I didn't want to go back to sea. Uh -huh. I was not going back down in the fire rooms. So I didn't like the CBs, and that's when I joined the National Guard. Now, I joined the National Guard as a Spec 5. Now, yeah, what, what unit? Uh, that that would be 2nd uh, and 108th Alpha Company, right here in Whitehall. Okay. The infantry, 11 Bravo. And I joined that as a Spec 5, and I made Sergeant about a year later. And uh, I stayed there for two more years after that. So, like, three years I was there. And I decided I had enough. I was too old to be an infantryman. And, and how many years uh, total service did you end up with? Counting in active time? Yeah. Probably 11. 11. All right. And uh, <clears throat> in between your, your bouts with the Reserve and National Guard, did you go back to uh, school, college, trade school? Yes. Yeah, I'm a machinist by trade. I went through a formal apprenticeship. But then after that, you had to 
upgrade your skills all the time. You know? mm -hmm. So you know, I, you know, I had to go back and I had to take welding. I had to brush up on more math. Oh, when you go through for a machinist apprentice, it's all math and science. You know, you don't go into a machine shop somewhere. You know, because you run machines 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So you don't need that kind of training. What you need is the, the corresponding training. You know, all the math and science and everything goes with it. Metallurgy, drafting is a biggie. And that's the kind of thing you take for your mm -hmm. machine apprenticeship. The curriculum set by the state of New York. Um, and then after that, I went back, oh, I went back for electricity. Uh, elect Tech 119, 120, I took that at ACC. That's all electricity. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've done drafting, more drafting, CAD programs I had to take, oh my god, all kinds of things. I took business, I've had business courses, what the name of that course, um, just, that was just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I tried to retrain there when they pulled me out of work, but I have PTSD, so concentration is a problem with me, and memory is a problem. So I was spending so much time just trying to prepare for class, and it wasn't mm -hmm. going to are you receiving any sort of comp compensation at all from the VA? Yeah, 100 percent. Oh, 100 percent disabled. Yeah, well, I, I have 50. I get it's all different. I'm 100 percent unemployable. 70 percent disabled. I see. And uh, the, my legs, I have neuropathy in my legs. My feet are numb, mm -hmm. and it goes all the way up into my knees. So I can't walk very far. I can't stand very far. I had to have a walker when my back goes out. And I have a cane that I'm supposed to use, but I don't. And they mm -hmm. wanted to buy me one of those motorized chairs, which that's rare that the VA will even do that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I told them no, I didn't want it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I have like 50% of it's PTSD. And then I have a whole bunch of other illnesses that put me, you get 50% of their 50%. So I get another 20% for my legs, uh -huh. for each leg, right? But there's another 40%, but they only give me a total of 20 because it's 40% of the remaining 50%. Oh, I see. And then you get, it's the VA math. It's, you know, I know guys that are, if you total it all up, they're like 150 or 160% and don't get 100% mm -hmm. because of the way they do the percentages. Mm -hmm. And they just, if there's a way of screwing people, they'll find it. Did you join any veterans organizations at all? I was a member of the Legion, American Legion here at Post 83, and then the politics of the place and the feuding, infighting that went on down there, I just got out. My father mm -hmm. warned me that would happen. He was a Bronze Star recipient when he was in there. And so I kind of distanced myself from the place. I am a life member of Chapter 79, Vietnam Veterans of America. Um, I won't join the BFW because a friend of mine, a guy by the name of Sloan, who was with me in 73, he's a combat veteran also. Mm -hmm. He didn't join the VFW because the dates aren't right that he was in Vietnam. <laughs> I wrote back and told him, I said, you know what I tell the VFW, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he did end up joining the Legion, though. Mm -hmm. so he's a member of the American Legion. But. Now, you mentioned uh, staying in contact uh, earlier with some of the fellows. Have you attended any reunions, show no. reunions? I was going to, they had one in Niagara Falls two or three years ago. That was when they first put me out of work. I say I was working, and then I went into for my normal checkup, and the doctor would let me go back. And so uh, they had one in Niagara Falls. I couldn't spend the money to go there at that time because I didn't know what was going to happen mm -hmm. as far as my retirements and everything went. And as it turned out, it, it was okay. I could have gone and spent the money, but I wanted to save what money I had. It wasn't the time to spend money on a vacation like that. Mm -hmm. And so now they're, they're having another one in this area, and they have them every year, and it's going to be in Boston, so I will go to that. It's in September of this year. Mm -hmm. Now, is your ship still in service? No, it was decommissioned and sold to the Greeks in 1991. Mm -hmm. And that's longer than we... That's longer than we should have kept it. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I get real angry with our with our Congress. I mean, we'll be sending these kids to war, and you know, uh, we've got modern guided missile destroyers can launch 64 missiles at a time. They got one gun. We were firing 500 rounds a day 
one gun is not going to last more than a couple of days without melting down. Mm -hmm. And I can show you pictures of that in here. It's called a hot round. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the recoil goes too far back. When that happens, you have to change the gun barrels. So when you've got Marines on the ground that need your gun, and your gun's broke, what do you do? You can only launch 64 missiles. It takes eight seconds to lock and load a missile. Three seconds is a lifetime to a Marine on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, we got all these high-tech things. We can shoot a satellite out of orbit, but can we support Marines on the ground like we're supposed to do? Modern ships can't do it. Mm -hmm. None of them. They're, they're the size of a World War II cruiser. They can't go up a river and fire a maneuver on a river. They, they're too big. They're too long. The only good thing about them is they're gas turbine instead of steam. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the great thing about them. But. Okay. Now, do you want to show us some of the photographs you've got? Sure. I won't show you that by DD-214. And this is a poem called Ode to a Snipe. That'll tell you something about what I do. This is a that's a copy of my Navy unit commendation. And that was was that your combat action ribbon? No, that's a Navy unit commendation. It's a separate ribbon. It's a it's it's up there as far as awards go. It's mm -hmm. under personal commendations, but it's above like uh, you know, say uh, just a simple letter. Okay. It's one of my highest awards. Ah, well, it is my highest award. This is what's called, this is what I'm telling you, a hot round. Now, bear in mind that gun mount, that, that water's going down, is completely electric. And we're dumping water down in fire hoses. What happens is these guns fire one round per second, but they only have a sustained rate of fire of 20 rounds a minute. So these barrels get so hot, these five inch guns will lock right up. And then you can't get the projectile out of the barrel until after you cool everything down. Uh -huh. In the meantime, this that projectile is already armed. You've got to get it out of there, push it out, get it over the side before it explodes on you. Jeez. Several guys have been killed doing this. It was very, very dangerous. When this happened, obviously in Vietnam, that's the only place you fire that many rounds that fast. Mm -hmm. And this is just a picture of some of the bullets that we fire in a single day. And those range anywhere from 76 pounds out to 100 pounds, depends on what they are. The armor piercing are the most heaviest, or the way the most, I'm sorry. Um, they uh, don't use armor piercing for tanks. These are big enough to take out a tank with just high explosives. Mm -hmm. or, uh, the armor piercing is for other ships, so we don't really carry that many. Okay. And mostly just HE and what they call the luminous, which are fairly light, 76 pounds. Okay. When you're handling 500 of them, they get kind of heavy by the end of the day. Then you go get to stay up all night long because you're at general quarters, battle stations. And this is Operation Freedom Train, just for these two weeks. Now this isn't all the targets, this isn't all the places that I had to go during Freedom Train, Linebacker, Linebacker 2. This just gives you an idea of what happened. And it was just where the locations, the little circles are the locations we were at at the time they logged it in. And the, the red tags and the buttons are the targets. Push pins are the targets. Okay. Got it. And this is the Quabia River. And that's the mouth, and that's. Point Allison is up here, Highway 1 is here, and it's hard to see. And these little circles are where we were at that time. They stop logging things when you go to general quarters. You don't bother to fill out the logs when you're in combat. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't require that. Funny. But, uh, <laughs> so that's, and that's, a, like I said, it's a larger river. It's roughly the size of the Hudson. I've also been in the mouth of the Perfume River. That's in like an estuary. It opens up. It's really weird looking. But you couldn't, I mean, it's no bigger than a brook. It's about the size of Mud Creek, so we didn't, we didn't go very far up it. <laughs> but that was uh, the retake, you know, way, mm -hmm. 72. And then those were supposedly in support of Arvin Marines. That's Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Yep. Army, that was Arvin First Marine, but uh, everything we were hearing, there were American Marines doing the fighting. And Arvin wasn't doing much fighting, and that 
uh, manifested at Queen Anne. And that's east northeast of Saigon on the coast. And I think that's about the farthest south I've ever been. I'm not sure which is farther south, Queen Anne or Duck Tho. But this was a small fire base in and around Queen Anne. And uh, Arvin went in their bunkers, wouldn't come out and fight, and left all the fighting up to 200 Marines. Hmm. So we, got, we did get those Marines out of there. And it took the entire fleet to do it, and we had to relieve them with an amphibious assault. But um, how many were alive, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. All I know is, first time in my, my life I ever felt sorry for Marines, because they were getting clobbered. Okay. And I think that's about it. This is a picture of the ship right here that's pulling into Hawaii. That's Ford Island in the background. That's Pearl, pulling into Pearl Harbor. And you can see by the lay on the bow that, that she's coming back from West Pack. Whether I was on it at this time, I don't know. It was just a picture on Wikipedia, so it's, okay. I don't know. I was on the ship at that time. Okay. Gary, did you have some questions? Charlie, where were you and your crew when, uh, when the treaty was signed? Out to sea somewhere. Out to sea? What would you guys think of it? Cop out. Uh, they so they signed that peace treaty in what? Uh, I think they signed it in March. January 29th. Yeah, all right. Signed, so they signed it in January. And well, no, then I would have just gotten there. That means I would have been just on my way there. I think I got there like January 14th. Well, we've been out to sea. Yeah, I was right on that. Well, exactly where it would probably been down just on gun line duties because that was before the East were offensive. And then uh, it came into effect March, right, or May. I'm not sure. All right, so, and, uh, you know, we just thought, you know, this is a cop out. I mean, just to get us out of here. And we knew what was going to happen. I mean, uh, the stories that were getting to us is that Arvin's charging urban helicopter pilots were charging their own wounded to take them out of the fight you know i mean uh, the, the whole situation was a fiasco collapsing fast uh, urban soldiers were getting 60 rounds a week they're burning up an m16 60 rounds you can do it in what two minutes yeah it, it, the whole thing was a fiasco if we had saved vietnam from the communists, it would collapse under its own weight. It'd be like modern day Somalia. Uh, it's probably a good thing that the communists did take it over. Uh, but the communists never beat us. We had them beat, and by the end of 73, they were beat. And I've, I've seen this on the internet, although I never heard the guy say it personally, there were the days of perpetuality, of calling it quits. And so we got to thank Jane for that, too. Did you ever uh, get shore leave actually into into Vietnam itself? No, I wouldn't allow it. The closest I got was we got a mic boat full of beer in Da Nang Harbor. Uh, you can't have beer on a Navy warship. So uh, they brought this mic boat. A mic boat is a landing craft. You know, they brought that alongside and loaded with beer and we got that beer ration. We've been out to sea at that time like about 40 days straight. You know, we ended up, I think the longest I was ever out was 52 days. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. You ever visited the um, Vietnam Memorials in uh, Washington, D.C.? I did. It was a very emotional experience for me. Very emotional. Um, I went down there for the 25th anniversary of the wall with Washington County. Sam Hall there. And Washington County had a thing going down. And uh, when I first went through, the, I had to go through it twice. When I first went through it, my wife was with me, and I, I had like a death grip on her. I didn't even want to look at it. It was like the wall was going to jump out and grab me or something. You know, and, you know, and I had Ray Bailey's on the wall. He was an old friend of mine, and Billy Aiken. And, uh, you know, I just, I had to walk through, and I had to, you know, just, you know, just try to keep a grip on things. And the second time, my wife said, you can't leave it at that. So I, I walked back through it again. And you know, I was better that time, and I went through it with uh, Boris Rouge and Jeff Belden. And you know, just having those guys around and my wife right there, you know, made things a lot easier. But it, yeah, it's a very emotional, very powerful place for me. You know? And it says it all. I, I went to the World War II Memorial while I was down there, and that's a beautiful thing, mm -hmm. right? But the wall says it all. 58,000 guys, 
What did we accomplish? Nothing. Do you have any questions? No. Um, is there anything else you'd like to touch on that, that maybe we missed? No. Just see, see Jane, tell her, drop dead. <laughs> and uh, you also got a uh, cruise book. Do you want to just hold that up and tell us a little bit about that? Well, all this does is it's a chronological event of where we were, and it shows the guys on the crew. When you go to war with guys, it's a whole different thing. This shows you pretty much the, the schedule. It's not 100%, but it's pretty close. I mean, this was written by guys during the cruise, so some of this stuff is ad-libbed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> by chance, is there a photo of you in, in that book? There is. There is. There's a couple of them. Uh, I gotta find the right here. Uh, if, if you... Uh, okay. Otherwise, it'll blur. I'm yep. a little Mexican-looking dude right here. That's what I looked like. Right? Gary would know me back then. That's you, huh? That would be me. Huh. Little guy right there. I'm on the watch down in the fire room. We're sitting. We're all crowded under those one of those blowers right there. That's why we look cool. But okay, it's anything but cool down there. You said there was another. There's another to where there's a group photo. Uh, and, then, and then I have a couple other things I'd like to show you in this. Sure. As long as you brought it up, I gotta find the engineering photos here. We're in M Division now. And I am again. Right there. Okay. Got it. Um going back. show you some of the things that went on here. There's that same picture with that hot round. This is alongside, that's the gun firing, one of the guns, that's the forward mount looking at it. This is the ship in dry dock in the Philippines. And there's a target being hit right there. Okay. That's a missile in the rail. That's an enemy gunboat. People tied up here were VC. Okay. And that's only the forward part, just a heavy machine gun, and they have a recoilless rifle on the back. Like I said, we sank 200 of those. Mm -hmm. We don't watch another ship sink. You don't do that. Even though it was home ported in Pearl Harbor, I've never been to the Arizona Memorial because it's bad juju. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. You jinx it yourself. And when you're on, when you're on ship, you take all the help you can get. Yeah. As soon as I get to the, there, here we are. These ships, are, these are not my ship. This is the USS Higby. There was 11 men inside that gun mount when it got blown up. Mm. This is the USS Stoddard. She got a hot round that blew apart and killed three men. And then she got hit here. This is in the front of the bow of the ship. Killed two more men. This is the Newport News down here. And she, and she blew her forward gun mount. That killed 22 guys. Hot rounds again. Mm -hmm. This is a, from a service air missile, the USS Buchanan. Every one of these ships were with us when, they, when these mishaps happened. This is some of it Operation Linebacker, some of it was like retaking Queen Tree City. Mm -hmm. um, just things like that. And uh, there are more. Mm -hmm. We lost 16 ships, 72. Only one of them was scrapped. None, were, none went under the water. But what do you call it when a ship makes it into Subic Bay? And then they have to scrap it because the damage is so severe. But mm -hmm. it's not sunk. So they, the Navy claims we never lost anything. Well, sure we did. We lost eight more in 1973. I mean, you know, they, they didn't sit there and let us shoot at them. And like I, our artillery duels were commonplace. Mm -hmm. Daily routine stuff. Okay. I think you pretty much touched on it uh, with... Uh 
what you had gone through with the with the VA and uh, the Agent Orange. How do you think overall your time in the service changed or affected your life? I grew up. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. There was no time. That I, I hear it on TV all the time how kids, how people under 21 are kids. So I was never an 18 year old kid. Mm -hmm. I was an 18 year old man. Mm -hmm. and I think we dumbed down kids. Uh, they weren't allowed to drink where I was drinking heavily at 18, 19, 20. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Okay, thank you.